Let me take you on a journey, ladies and gentlemen, back in time to December 2015, where Fawn Mead made a video, or perhaps Fawn Mead, a video, Your Argument Sucks, which was aimed at anti-feminists, telling them why their arguments were all such a load of crap. The video was six and a half minutes long. I didn't make a response, but Sargon of Akkad did, and his response included all of the original video, and it ran to 23 minutes. I didn't make a response to that, but now Danny Cox has made a response to that, which includes all of Sargon's video, including all the bits of Sargon's video, where Sargon shows all the bits of the original video, and Danny's video is 37 minutes long. Clearly if I respond in the same way, the video is going to go on for hour after hour after hour. So that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to show some of the original video, a little bit of uh, Sargon's video, and a bit of Danny's video to make the points that I want to make. Okay, let's start off with a little bit of form. Let's start off on a woodland thing. So for whatever reason, you found yourself in an argument against feminism. But here's the thing, your argument sucks. Ooh, they're fighting words fawn, aren't they? That's a hell of a start. You know, but what really interests me is do these anti-feminist arguments suck anything like as hard as your seeming inability to string just two fucking consecutive sentences together anywhere in your entire video without having to resort to a jump cut? That's a bit that I'd really like to know. And yes, as you may have noticed, I am the no all gone of a card in this video and no it isn't because I've been on the sherry again okay okay I'll tell you what let's just play a little clip of Danny's video let's start with the most basic shutdown against feminism feminism is sexist you've come to this conclusion because you've been taught that sexism is basically the prejudice stereotyping and discrimination on the basis of sex right because that is the standard English definition of the word sexism and you just agreed to it. One clever bait-and-switch bit of doublespeak that Sargon pulls here that many anti-feminists do is conflating the sociological definition of words with the common definition of words. Oh, I've got to be honest, this is one of the things that bugs the crap out of me, right? You know, it'd be nice to have Sargon of Akkad's 500,000 subscribers just because if you can be asked to make a video, it's great to have it viewed by as many people as possible and yeah, it'd be lovely to have all the advertising revenue. But every now and again, there's a point where you'd really, really like to have that kind of reach because you just want to make a point that hits a few more people. And that's one of these points right now with regard to the definition of sexism. And this crap that there is this sociological definition of sexism as prejudice plus power, and that is the sociological definition, as opposed to this common definition. And the idea of a common definition makes it sound as if that's the kind of definition that two slightly ignorant, ill-informed blokes would be using if they're having a discussion in the pub. But actually, by common definition, it's also the kind of definition that the United Nations are working to, that the European Union are working to, that organisations like Kick Racism Out of Football are using, that governments like the UK government, when they frame racial discrimination legislation, are using. They don't have these requirements that it has to be prejudice plus power. It just has to be prejudice, prejudice on the grounds of race and ethnicity, or in terms of sex, in terms of gender and biological sex. Right, so let's get away from this crap about common definition being some kind of ill-informed definition. But what about this idea that the sociological definition is prejudice plus power? Well, actually, that's not true. Now, some sociologists use that kind of definition, and they use it quite in quite a valid way. Because in terms of what they are trying to study, right, they are trying to study racism or sexism in terms of power and power structure. But that doesn't make that the sociological definition. Fawn Mead herself gives us a link uh, to try and evidence a point, although slightly face palmingly, the link goes to the everydayfeminism.com site, as if that's some kind of highbrow academic source. But let me read you what it says on the link that she gives. You want an easy, shallow definition of racism to endorse your unsupported viewpoint? Go to the dictionary. I wish it had kind of sneer, sneer in brackets there. But if you want to apply a critical race theory lens to a conversation around power and oppression, well, OK, but what about if you don't want to apply a fucking critical race theory lens to a conversation around power and oppression? Not all conversations on racism are about power and oppression. And in fact, critical race theory 
is intrinsically about power. That is what it's about. Critical race theory is the idea of this kind of white power structure that oppresses black people. That is what it's about. So if you're discussing racism in the context of critical race theory, of course it's going to be about power. But that doesn't make the definition of racism about power. How about instead of looking at this source, okay, we do look at some dictionaries, right? But we're not going to look at the bloody Merriam-Webster dictionary or the Oxford dictionary. How about, well, I tried to start off with the Oxford dictionary of sociology because you'd think a sociology dictionary, that's going to be a pretty good place to give a sociological definition. Unfortunately, you need uh, to purchase a subscription to get the full definition. So I didn't get any further than sexism is unfair discrimination on the basis of sex. It ranges from the blatant to the covert, okay? But in that first line, there's no mention of power. Here's a better source. Blackwell Encyclopedia of Sociology Online. Sexism is discrimination on the basis of sex and or gender. It occurs at various levels from the individual to the institutional and involves practices that promote gender-based prejudice and stereotyping of social roles. None of this crap that it has to include prejudice plus power, otherwise it isn't sexism. And this is in a dictionary, an encyclopedia of sociology for fuck's sake. So could we please stop playing this particular game now, please? Because it's all too transparently manipulative. Creating this scenario whereby if I say something, it's sexist, but if somebody says the same thing back to me, it isn't sexist because, hey, prejudice plus power. That if I say something, it's racist, but if somebody of a different ethnicity says exactly the same thing back to me, that isn't racist because, hey, racism is prejudice plus power. It's bullshit. It isn't even the sociological definition. It's just a definition that some sociologists use in some branches of the social sciences. This is what I call conversational gerrymandering. It's trying to manipulate the dialogue so that you auto-score a win before you've even had the argument, and it's bullshit. Before I even get into this, I just want to state that it's impossible for the oppressor to be the oppressed. Ooh, that's embarrassing. I'm... Oh, I, that's cringy, actually. I'm so sorry. Not... I mean, I, I'm sure that you are terribly, terribly oppressed. But, I mean, maybe, maybe if you'd done your research, you'd know what a kiriarchy is. And you'd know that, actually, the oppressor can also be the oppressed in different ways. Because, and I, I hate to introduce you to this term, it's called intersectional feminism. That feeling when an anti-feminist on the internet is a better feminist than you. That's... Oh, it's embarrassing, isn't it? Sargon once again pulls a clever bit of sleight of hand that first-time viewers may miss. And much of his audience fails to notice this because they're impressed by his use of karaoke. What Vaughn is saying is that it's impossible for the oppressor to be the oppressed in that specific relationship. For example, an African-American male still has male privilege, while a white female still has white privilege. The privileges do not cancel each other out, nor are they linear in their measurement. The African-American male is oppressed in terms of race, but privileged in terms of gender. And before I put any meat on the bones of this particular part, let me say that a few seconds later, Danny has a little bit of a swipe at Sargon and says that, you know, Sargon never manages, and he's not the only one, he never manages to make a video about feminism without getting a little comment in somewhere about Marxism. It wouldn't be a Sargon of Akkad video without some comparison of progressivism to Marxism. Okay, so I have a little bit of sympathy for what Danny says there. I think it is a card that's overplayed a little bit much. Uh, we even have Dean Esme now of Escaping Atheism. He can never mention atheism without mentioning cultural Marxism, right? But if there is one example where it's absolutely reasonable to mention it, it's got to be in the context of Dawn's video by Christ. She boils this down to oppressor classes and oppressed classes and says that the oppressor class can never be the oppressed and if that isn't straight out the Marxist copybook, then I want you to tell me what is, Danny. I think 
Sargon is absolutely justified in this particular context in mentioning that. Personally speaking, I don't think these are very useful words. I wish he'd chosen some different terms rather than the language of the oppressor and the oppressed. But that's what he's chosen, so that's what we've got to run with. Now, Sargon makes this argument about intersectional feminism. Danny actually makes a pretty legitimate point that Sargon's really tilting at a slightly different fucking windmill here. Um, in that what he's saying is, well, you might be oppressed on one axis, but you're not oppressed on another axis. But that's kind of beside the point that Dawn was making. Notwithstanding that, the point that Dawn was making was a really crap point. Because even if we just look at one axis of oppression, right, what a really flat way of thinking to see it in terms of an absolute oppressor and an absolute oppressed. Because we run over more than one social systems. Our lives don't just boil down to one social system. Um, and there's a winner and a loser. Look, I tell you what I do to try and make the point. Let me draw you a little graph. Okay, we're going to get really high tech here. Okay, so I've drawn you some axes here, and there's a kind of vague axes of privilege and social systems and effectively if we put men and women here there the blokes and the ladies there uh, for everybody from the UK so you know what I'm talking about this is how Dawn sees it really I think that the men always seem to be he seem to have more privilege across the board right rather than the ladies so the oppressor can never be the oppressed but really, that isn't how social systems function. So I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's get rid of those because they're a load of crap. Really, this is what we're looking at. So if you look at what we've got here, it's a much more complicated business. That over the different gamut of social systems over which our lives function, there will be ones in which men have more privilege, but also ones in which women have more privilege. Now, some of you are going to say, well, give me some example of these, Noel. I don't know. We could go on all day about this couldn't we? And I really don't want to get too caught up in the specifics of the examples because that's not what this video is about. But I don't know. Let's say this peak here uh, where the men seem to have more privilege. That could be in terms of political representation, couldn't it? Uh, in terms of actual representatives, whether that's in the Houses of Parliament or whether it's in Congress. OK, so men have more representatives. And maybe this peak here, this is a huge peak here. That could be in terms of sporting opportunities to get wealthy in sport. There's a lot more advertising in men's sport because there's a lot more interest in men's sport mainly because men are more interested in watching sport than women it has to be said which means that men have a lot more privilege in terms of sporting opportunities than women have but then there are these other privileges as well I don't know there's a great privilege for women there that could be in terms of well I mean these are things that feminists agree with right so I'm not saying anything highly controversial for feminists here this could be in terms of how we view parenthood how we view motherhood in terms of the privilege associated with motherhood including legal privileges in the UK versus the privileges and status we associate with fatherhood and uh, maybe if we look at this peak here uh, this could be in terms of how much interest we have in terms of those issues that affect just women versus those issues that affect just men. Again, this is another point that feminists generally agree with. That the, well, they say it's the pa this is the patriarchy. This is how patriarchy hurts men too and expects men to just toughen up. So we're not really that interested in men's issues. So, for example, rough sleeping. Ninety percent of those that sleep rough on the street in the United Kingdom are men, and we don't really give a flying crap about that whereas I've never found anybody who disagrees with this point if 90% of those that slept rough on the street in the United Kingdom were women that would be a major major issue we'd be much more concerned in dealing with that so we have this kind of mixed picture why because the environment in which we live is more than just one social system. So how does Dawn's analysis fit into this? All she can be doing is counting the peaks and saying, well, look, women have like one, two, three, four, five, six peaks of privilege where they have the most privilege. And look, men have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, social systems where they have more privilege. So the men have won it, haven't they? The blokes have won it seven to six Therefore, they are the oppressor class, uh, women are the oppressed class, and men can never be oppressed. So effectively, all these peaks here were just to kind of pretend that they don't exist anymore. And I think that demonstrates why this is a really, really crap way 
of looking at it. It's nothing to do with intersectionality. It's nothing to do with looking at different axes of oppression. Just within this one axis of oppression, it's a really, really crap argument. But men can get raped too. I can't stand this argument. You have to be a certain level of horrible to pit victims against each other, whatever gender. What a fucking bizarre thing to say. Nobody is pitting victims against each other, you sociopath. The reason that saying, yeah, but men can get raped too, is an argument against feminism, is because you are specifically excluding them from your activism. And therefore you can perceive someone else mentioning a separate group of victims that you have no interest in talking about as a challenge against feminism. If feminism was actually trying to help male victims of rape, people wouldn't be able to offer male victims of rape as an argument against feminism. Uh, so this is going to be a point where these two Acadians, Nolgon and Sargon, don't quite see eye to eye. I hope they don't take their subscriber armies onto the battlefield, otherwise I don't really fancy Nolgon's chances on this particular one. But I agree with Sargon when he takes issue with Dawn with regard to Men Get Raped too. She strips it of all context and then just draws the worst possible conclusion from its usage that she can. And yet that is used in a whole variety of contexts. And the context that I've heard it haven't been pitting one group of victims against the other. That was a somewhat bizarre claim to make. Where I dis disagree with Sargon is this idea, this advocacy that feminism should be about men's issues too. Now it is true that some feminists make this claim that feminism is about everybody's issues. It's about issues of gender equality wherever they exist. It's about men's issues as well as women's issues. And in fact, they take this and they run with it way further than they should. We have this idea of intersectionality, or feminists have this idea of intersectionality within feminism, and they don't even understand that. The idea of intersectionality is, is that if you are a black woman, there may be issues that are specific to you as a woman because you are black, and that they need to be dealt with separately. It doesn't mean that every issue that affects you because you're black becomes part of feminism. It doesn't mean black issues are feminist issues. It just means that a black woman's issue might be different to, to the issues that a, that a woman might face if she isn't black. That's all that it means. It doesn't make everybody's issues feminists' issues. But Sargon seems to be one of these people and is he, he isn't the only one that thinks that feminism needs to be taking men's issues on board as well. I don't think that it should do and I want to propose that it isn't a very good situation for anybody if that takes place. For starters, if you remember, we always used to use words like fireman and chairman. And we've had to change and start using words like firefighter or chairperson, or in fact chair is the term that's often used now, even though it makes somebody sound like they're just an inanimate object sat there at the end of the boardroom. In fact, some chair people are just inanimate objects sat there at the end of the boardroom. But we've had to, do, to alter that language, partly because feminists have complained, maybe with some justification, that while ever we use gendered terms, chairman, fireman, we're always going to see those roles as gendered roles. We're always going to start to perceive a man in there, even if a woman would be the best person for that role. So we've had to drop that. To try and be unbiased in terms of those things, we've had to start using non, non uh, gender neutral terms in those particular things. Well, if that applies there, and if feminism is going to be about men's issues, right, and judging men's issues and women's issues based on need, rather than prejudicing it from the outset and being biased in favour of women's issues, how can, we, how can that work under something which is called feminism? And this is the problem. If we're going to take men's issues seriously, if they're going to get a fair hearing, a fair crack of the whip, then it really isn't going to ever take place under feminism for a start, while ever it's called feminism, but also with its history of being about women's issues. So I'm absolutely fine with feminism being about issues of gender equality and majoring on women's issues, but I don't think that that's a very fertile environment to deal with men's issues. 
The second thing is, is that there is some antagonism, you may have noticed it here and there, between organisations that specifically try and deal with men's issues and those people that try and deal with men's issues under the auspices of feminism. I've named him before, I'll name him again because he's a perfect example, Ali Fogg, who tackles men's issues almost exclusively, but he calls himself a feminist, he does it under the auspices of feminists, and he says that people that, w that are involved in these men's rights organizations are all a bunch of absolute wankers he doesn't want anything to do with them now how are men's rights issues ever going to get the same kind of treatment that they deserve as women's issues get the kind of treatment that they deserve if you're going to have this antagonism right from the start of these two highly antagonistic groups working in opposition to each other working on men's issues that's why i disagree with sargon of akkad with respect to this but in the context of why your argument sucks we are fully aware that men get raped too we are not ignorant what we were actually discussing was rape culture so not the act itself rape culture is when you ask victims what they were wearing were they flirting beforehand asking if they possibly had too much to drink no no that's not rape culture this is a problem and this is the problem that happens all the time rape culture is the prevalence of rape and normalization of attitudes towards rape not towards other things what you're talking about are things which are commonly associated with rape culture and you're talking about attitudes towards these things that are commonly associated with rape culture culture, not attitudes towards rape. This is a shifty little trick that happens all too often, I'm afraid. And it happens in terms of evidencing rape culture, is that people end up evidencing the things that are associated with rape culture as if that's the same thing as actually evidencing rape culture. I gave an example of just this kind of thing and why it's, it, it's fallacious reasoning in a video of mine, Do We Live in a Rape Culture Part 2 Bullshit Edition, where I said this, that parrots are associated with pirates. But that doesn't mean that we can evidence the existence of pirates and piracy just by demonstrating the presence of parrots. Whilst anyone can get raped, rape culture predominantly affects women. Men do not get asked if they were showing too much skin. No. With respect or no, and it's a really, really big no. And this is exactly why the previous point that I made was absolutely fundamental here. Because you haven't shown that rape culture doesn't affect men. You haven't shown that rape against men isn't prevalent. You haven't shown that rape against men attitudes towards rape against men isn't normalised in society. What you've shown instead is that one of of the factors that is commonly associated with rape culture doesn't relate to male rape. That is not the same thing. Here's how your argument wouldn't suck. Every single rape prevention tip is geared towards people being in charge of not getting raped. Not teaching rapists not to rape. <sighs> What a, what a strange way of phrasing that that was. And yet, you, you do a jump cut every five or six seconds, every sentence. So I can only assume if you weren't happy with that, you'd have gone back and changed it. You're talking about rape prevention tips. In what world is teaching rapists not to rape a rape prevention tip? It's like, look, I'm really interested in making my house safe from burglars. But if I went down the police station and said, I'd like some advice on making my house a little bit more secure, and they said, said don't steal. I mean, unless we're talking about people raping themselves, how is teaching rapists not to rape? How does that even classify as a rape prevention tip? I propose that what you need to do, Fawn, is to try and disassociate, dissociate two different things. On the one hand, there is rape prevention advice, the same way as we give advice to people in terms of any kind of crime, whether it be putting virus software, antivirus software on your computer, whether it's making your house secure, maybe it's regard to not getting into fights for blokes, right, when you've had too many drinks, whatever it is, we have that kind of advice. And then on the other hand, we have how we deal with rapists, right? Let me read you a couple of passages from Rain, the Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network, which is a pretty big thing in the United States. Thanks to repeated messages from parents, religious leaders, teachers, coaches, the media, and yes, the culture at large, the overwhelming majority of these young adults have learned right from wrong and enter college knowing that rape falls squarely in the latter category. 
Dr. David Lissack estimates that 3% of college men are responsible for more than 90% of rapes. Now, at least you said, at least you said we need to teach rapists not to rape, not that we need to teach men not to rape, which is the usual line that's trotted out. But even in terms of rapists, even in terms of these 3% of men that are responsible for 90% of rapes, do you think that they all don't know that they are raping or they're not aware that rape is wrong? Do you think maybe, just maybe, they are raping in spite of what they know? Now, look, you're just waving this pretty crap sort of banner sloganeering bullshit that we get, teach men not to rape. Um, line, but there is a conversation that perhaps is worth having with regard to consent and with regard to something which I suppose you could call the grey areas or the fringes of consent, although I'm sure there's somebody screeching and shrieking at the monitor now that there are no grey areas when it comes to consent, but of course there are, whether we're talking about rape or consent for anything, there are grey areas especially when alcohol or other social drugs are used and when you speak to people on this actually people have a very very poor understanding of what constitutes consent and what constitutes the grounds and the situations in which an adult can legitimately give consent and when it gets beyond the point where even if they appear to be consenting they're not consenting and this is an ignorance that takes place on both sides of this argument so yes there are some arguments that need to be had there are some discussions that are worth having with regard to consent but that isn't in, that isn't in terms of teaching men not to rape and it isn't in terms of teaching rapists not to rape. I am so sick hearing about feminism. Shocker, so are we. Please help us not have to talk about this all the time. <laughs> oh, oh, bless you, Don. How endearingly naive. It's kind of quite sweet, that. Look, but I'm afraid human nature kind of lets us down a little bit there because I'm just, I'm afraid it is just a feature of human nature that people complain that they are hard done by even when they're getting a fair deal. And so, you know, it would be nice, wouldn't it, if there was some light at the end of the tunnel with these kind of things, but there isn't, I'm afraid. And so that isn't a kind of good metric by which to judge when all these things are dealt with. In fact, in fact, what, in fact fuck it, right? This is, I'm going to call this Noel Gon's Law, right? Which is, which is something like... The best indicator of a fair society is not when everyone stops complaining that they are hard done by. Rather, it's when everyone is complaining they're hard done by. Well, I'm a woman and I don't find that offensive. This is quite a hefty topic about internalised misogyny and that is a whole other video. Your argument sucks because you do not speak on behalf of all women. Whoa! Sorry about that. No, just let me silence that here. That's my hypocrisy detector uh, going off again there. So let me see if I can get this straight, Fawn. Right, you don't like you don't like women telling you how you should feel because that's the implication, isn't it? They don't find it offensive, right? So the implication is that all the women shouldn't find it offensive, that you shouldn't find it offensive. And who are they to speak on you your behalf? Who are they to tell you how you should feel? And yet when you make this statement, you are prepared to stand there and unblinkingly tell them that the the way they feel is due to some internalized hatred that they have towards women. Aren't you doing exactly the same thing that you're just accusing them of doing? Yeah, but what about men's rights? Men already have all the rights. I think people use this argument a lot because it's hard to see just how something affects your life until you don't have it. Oh, okay, Fawn. So, look, riddle me this one, if you will. Look, we, we know what we're talking about here, aren't we? We're talking about something that feminists, social scientists call privilege blindness. This idea that, and I suppose we're talking about this in the context of men, that men have certain privileges that they are not aware of, and they're not aware that other people don't have those privileges. That's what privilege blindness means. You have it, and you're kind of blind blinded to the fact that other people don't have those privileges and yet what do you do you stand in front of the camera what what is this is this some kind of you know high high level satire here you're trying to give an example of privilege blindness yourself because you stand there and in response to the line what about men's rights you stand there and go 
What rights? Men have all the rights. Well, yet, yeah, so how are you warding off the fact that you could do exactly the same thing? That there could be rights that men are missing out on and you're not aware of it. Why? Because you have those rights yourself. Um, I mean, we both live in the UK, so I would have thought you would have, at least even if you've not been aware of anything else, right, you would have been aware that when it comes to newborn babies and parents, unmarried parents I'm talking about here, the situation is very asymmetrical. The mother intrinsically, innately has all the legal rights to that, but over that baby with regard to that baby, the father does not. The father initially is very, very much uh, at the mercy of the goodwill of the mother uh, to have his rights. And if she does not have that goodwill, his only recourse is potentially very expensive legal action to try and get the same rights, not extra rights, just the same rights that the mother has towards uh, the child. Right, so I don't know, maybe is that your privilege blindness that was at work there? Yeah, but what about men's rights? Men already have all the rights. Neither you nor any other feminist can name a right that men have that women do not. We have all the same rights, you annoying bind. The rights go far beyond just fundamental legal rights. However, if you want to go there, challenge accepted. Feminism has gained women those legal rights, which are now under attack by anti-choice legislation in the U.S. Also, in many areas, female toplessness is illegal. Okay, well, first off, let me say Danny, 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 Danny. Look, on the on the toplessness one, I, I'm with you, bro. Okay, I'm absolutely with you. That is one that the patriarchy has royally fucked up upon there. Okay, so I'm more than happy for that one. Uh, to change, but when you're talking about this whole abortion business and pro-choice and pro-life and all that, look, let me say first off, right off the bat, I am resolutely and absolutely on the pro-choice camp, and I do believe that it should be a woman's right to decide to have an abortion. But let's not try and make this out of some situation where, like, women are getting necessarily getting less rights than men are. After all, if you look in if you look in somewhere such as England, right? And England's a good one to choose. You give example after example about the United States and laws there, and I know there are problems in some states of the United States with regard to abortion. But in England, where I'm from, in England, where Sargon's from, in England, where Fawn is from. From. Look at the fucking flag and listen to her accent, right? You can have an abortion. Fawn could have an abortion. She has the right to do that, right? If she's going to become a parent, then she has the right to terminate that and not become a parent. Now, in many ways, that means she has more rights than the father will have. At the point where she becomes pregnant, she actually has more rights than the father has there. Am I complaining about that? No, I'm not. I think that's probably the only way that we can do it. I don't believe that we can allow fathers to abdicate from their parental responsibility because we can't really kind of quite afford that as a society. So it's kind of hard shit on men in a way that we have this asymmetry. But you can't play that asymmetry in places where abortion is allowed as somehow equalizing things. It hasn't equalized things. If abortion isn't allowed then I agree that women are getting the shitty end of the stick but uh, but you know paradoxically when you allow abortion actually women are getting a better deal potential mothers are getting a choice that potential fathers do not get feminism is ruining movies slash series slash comics this argument gets rolled out every time something gets launched with women in it basically why is it totally fine to expect women to enjoy and relate to things that involve mainly men but as soon as more than one woman comes on screen, we're taking over. Would well, you know what, Fawn? If that is the case, and as much as that is the case, then point taken. But... But in my experience, it goes somewhat beyond that. And it also includes berating anyone and everyone who creates any kind of entertainment product that doesn't quite merit this feminist stamp of approval, right? In many ways, you're kind of portraying it as if it's some kind of simple example of, well, we just want our toys too, right? That's what feminists are saying. We just want our entertainment toys too. And yet when I hear the analysis of people like Anita Sarkeesian, I don't hear them saying, 
saying, well, we just want our toys too. What I hear them saying is something along the lines of, we want our toys and your toys are sexist and therefore unacceptable. Not all men. If we're discussing something about men and it's not something that you have particularly done, then that's great. The reason why your argument sucks is because you have to understand that many men have done this. A majority even. It's always sucky to have to acknowledge that something that you're a part of has bad bits, but that's just life. So stop driving conversations back to you because it's not about you. Well, this is a classic old chestnut, isn't it? It's like the, oh, for God's sake, you've said not all men. I can't believe it. We never said all men assault women. All we said was men assault women. And some men do assault women. We never said all men assault women. So if you don't assault women, there's no need for you to take it personally. Is there? Because we're obviously not talking about you. And that's basically what you're saying, Fawn. But then on another day, somebody will say something to you something like feminists hate men right and your response will be well I'm a feminist I don't hate men why are you making that sweeping assumption in other words what you're saying is not all feminists and yet they could make the same point and say oh well I never said all feminists hate men did I I just said feminists hate men so if you're one of those feminists that doesn't hate men it doesn't apply to you so what's your problem can we just have a little fucking I tell you what let's have a fucking 45 gallon drum of reality here right and the truth is is that everybody gets a little bit prickly about generalizations when it's either made in their direction or made in, in the direction of a group or a cause or something that they feel some kind of investment towards. So let's not keep playing this stupid fucking game, right, of standing there all naive and wide-eyed. Like, how could you possibly find that offensive? How could you possibly take that the wrong way? Because everybody is taking this the wrong way. The thing with all these arguments against feminism is that if you wanted to have a proper discussion about it, you would have Googled it and done your research, but you didn't, which makes you an ass. Oh, I mean, I've got to be honest with you, Fawn. I watched all of your video. I wasn't entirely convinced by the end that perhaps you'd spent as long as you needed to researching the subjects that you wanted to talk about. But I've got to throw your own question back to you. How interested are you genuinely in having a discussion when you spend most of this video wearing a t-shirt that says feminism, the radical notion that women are people, thereby framing your opponents as individuals who do not acknowledge women's basic humanity, who don't even regard women as people. But generally you should just research things that you're talking about and if you don't know anything about a subject don't weigh in with your opinion and maybe just trust what people say about their own experiences just kind of simple stuff. Okay well if I can be so bold as to try and sum up Fawn Sage Council here is something along the lines that basically don't just weigh in with your experiences, but at the same time trust what everybody else says with theirs. Once again, it's a case of go away with your anecdotal evidence, but don't dare deny my lived experience, shitlord. Okay, I think that's about it. I think we're done here. Uh, I'd like to thank Fawn, I'd like to thank Sargon of Akkad, and I'd like to thank Danny Corks for their videos. Bye-zee-bye, everybody. Bye-zee-bye.